Starting off this countdown, we have the Stagecoach painting. So this painting has a very dark and twisted backstory, so no wonder it's cursed. So in 1994, a photographer named James Kidd took a bunch of photos of stagecoaches in Tombstone, Arizona. However, upon developing the photos, he realized he captured a ghost of a headless man. And then a painter thought it would be a good idea to recreate this photo as an oil painting. So she painted this headless ghost man and the ghost attached itself to the painting. Like seriously, what did she expect? So when the painting was complete, it was hung at a business. But a couple of days later, the business demanded that she take it back. Apparently, the painting was found crooked every morning, despite them constantly fixing it. They also blamed the painting for paperwork going missing and appointments getting messed up. The painting was just bringing them bad luck. So the painter brought it back to her home and she started experiencing bad luck. Her garage roof started leaking, but roofers couldn't find the source of the leak. And when the painting was moved, the leak stopped. That's what you get for painting a photo of a ghost. Wow, what a creepy painting. Let's move on to number nine with the Pyramid of Skulls. Before I go any further, make sure to give this video a big thumbs up because it really helps us out. So the Pyramid of Skulls is just as it sounds. It's a painting of a bunch of skulls on top of each other. It was completed by painter Paul Cezanne. Now here's where it gets creepy. As Paul started getting older, he became fascinated by death. So from 1898 up until his death, all he would paint are these creepy paintings filled with skulls. This particular piece apparently emphasizes the fact that you need to confront death and reflect on it. Not only that, but his genre of painting is called Memento Mori, which translates into remember that you have to die. So if that isn't creepy, then I don't know what is. Moving on to number eight, we have the Raft of Medusa. The Raft of Medusa was created by Theodore Garrico back in 1819. The painting depicts the real life shipwreck of the French naval Frigette Meduse. On July 5th, 1816, 147 men set sail on this raft. Only 15 managed to survive. But those that did survive turned to cannibalism after being severely starved. Just knowing that backstory makes the painting way darker than it already is. Back to you, Brie. All right, in the number seven, we have the Japanese girl drawing. This is another painting with a very dark backstory. So legend goes that a Japanese student was found dead in her room. This was the last image that she had drawn before taking her own life. In fact, she scanned this image and posted it online for everyone to see. But legend goes if you stare into this girl's eyes too long, then she will get you to take your own life as well. Some who have stared at it for a while have claimed that the portrait turns evil. The girl gets an evil looking smirk on her face and dark circles appear under her eyes. If that's what evil looks like, then I guess I'm evil because I look like that in the morning. Making our way down the list, number six, we have the Mona Lisa. Now I know what you're thinking. Lindsay, how is this painting scary? Well, it's not, but its backstory certainly is. So there's this famous urban legend surrounding the Mona Lisa. Apparently, a French artist took his life because he was driven mad by the mystery of the Mona Lisa's smile. French artist's name was Luc Mapereau. On June 23rd, 1852, he threw himself from the fourth floor of his Paris hotel. Later, a note was found in his room that read, and I quote, For years, I have grappled desperately with Mona Lisa's smile. I prefer to die. Sadly, that's all we know about this case and Luke. It was featured in a 1999 Smithsonian article and in a book from 1966. It's a pretty creepy case. And now I will never be able to look at the Mona Lisa the same. Coming in at number five, we have the Weeping Children. The Weeping Children are a collection of paintings created by a man named Giovanni Bragolin. Every painting features a little boy or girl crying. Now it's said whoever owns these paintings will face tragedy. So in this case, all of Giovanni's paintings are cursed. In fact, a string of house fires were all thought to have been caused by this painting. All of the houses that caught on fire were completely destroyed except for the paintings that remained perfectly undamaged. Take the case of Roy and May Hall. This couple owned one of these paintings. Their house unexpectedly caught fire and they almost lost everything, except for the painting of a crying boy that wasn't even blackened by smoke. Yeah, I've heard of those paintings before. It's super freaking creepy. Okay, in at number four, we have Zidzla Bukaski. Look, I know I said his name wrong. Okay, I know I butchered it. 
just move on from it. Now this dude has created a number of creepy looking paintings, but the scariest one is this one right here. It features this weird creature crawling with a bloody wrap on its head. Honestly, it really creeps me out. To make matters worse, apparently this painting is cursed. And if you see it three different times, then you'll die. Yeah, so we all just saw the image once, two more times and bye bye. Okay, I mean, there's no proof that this legend is real, but still, I never wanna see that painting in my life ever again. I agree, I never want to see that painting again. Okay, moving on to number three, we have the collage of art balls. Here is another painting that can kill. So this painting is associated with a Japanese urban legend. Legend goes that if you look at this painting five times, then you will die. A little death note, but Whatever. I mean, hey, at least it's five times and not three like the other painting Lindsay mentioned. Besides that, not a lot of people know much about this painting. It was painted in 2010, but we don't know by whom. And we don't know why it's cursed either. I mean, it's just a painting of a ball. And at number two, we have Watson and the Shark. This painting is a depiction of a real life tragedy. It was created by John Singleton Copley in 1778. Basically, back in 1749 in Havana, Cuba, a visitor on the royal consort was the victim of a brutal shark attack. He lost his leg in the attack and was badly injured, but thankfully he was rescued. This painting depicts just that which is very dark. And finally, in at number one, we have Man Proposes, God Disposes. This painting was created by Edwin Landseer in 1864. It depicts Sir John Franklin's ill-fated expedition in 1845. This painting is how Edwin imagined their fate would be but little did he know that he created an extremely cursed painting. So this painting is hung up in the exam hall at the Royal Holloway University of London. Rumor has it that in the 1970s, a student took his own life after staring at the painting while taking his exam. All he left behind was a note on his exam paper that read, the polar bears made me do it. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have this hunting cave painting. This painting comes to us from an astonishing 44,000 years ago and was found on the wall of a cave on an Indonesian island. Researchers were able to date this painting that far back due to the fact that the cave it was found in is still living, which means that rock formations have been growing over the painting. And by being able to date those, they know that it is at least 43,900 years old, but it could potentially be even older. The painting features what looks like a hunting scene with four wild pigs, some small buffalo, and a group of really small hunters with spears. The strange thing about these hunters, other than their size, is the fact that they're all human and animal hybrids. They all have elongated faces like an animal snout, and a lot of them have tails. There's even one tiny human thing that has a beak. We don't really know why they depicted the hunters this way or why the animals are so much larger than them. There also were no other usual signs of human life found in the cave, such as bones or hunting tools. This cave may have acted as some sort of special or sacred spot for them, but I can't imagine a sacred spot that only holds a strange hunting painting. It definitely sounds a little creepy to me. In our number nine spot today, we have the ambassadors. Before I dive into this one, guys, please don't forget to hit the thumbs up button if you're enjoying the video so far, because it really helps us out. Okay, this one might not exactly be old enough to be considered ancient, but this is my list, and I definitely believe this one still belongs. The Ambassadors by Hans Holbein the Younger was created in 1533, and a first glance at it, it just seems like a nice painting of two men, two ambassadors, but that is not the case. This painting is full of imagery that has had professionals debating for years what it really is all about. The debated figures include the two globes, one being terrestrial and one being celestial. There's a bunch of different measuring devices, two of which are sundials, the variation of textiles, the open religious text, or the difference in clothing between the two ambassadors. This all might seem arbitrary, but the details of course must have been intentional, but what does it all mean? It is believed that this painting may be trying to convey religious strife or the interruption of religious harmony, but we truly aren't sure. The most notable feature of this painting, however, is the distorted skull that is featured at the bottom middle of the painting. The anamorphic skull is meant to be a visual puzzle as it requires a different perspective to clearly see, and no one is really sure why Hans gave this skull such a prominent place in the painting. One theory, however, is that this painting may be intended to show three levels. The heavens, which is shown by the astrolabe, then the earthly world which is represented by the text and the instruments, and then the final being the underworld represented by the skull. It is possible that Hans may have just wanted to remind us all of our mortality. In our 
number eight spot today, we have the Giants in Egyptian paintings. This one is less of a specific painting and more so just a feature that is seen in a lot of ancient Egyptian paintings. There's a common theme of giants in these. This may have been a representation of people being of a higher status or being the more important figure in the painting, but many believe that this may be a sign that there were really giants in ancient Egypt. Considering how strange the pyramids are to us and how little we really know about their construction, how can we say for sure that there weren't giants? If there were, what happened to them? This is one that really has me stumped. What do you guys think? Let me know below in the comments if you think this is a case of the person being depicted as a giant because of their social status, or do you think it's possible that giants really did exist at one point? In our number seven spot today, we have Medusa. Another one of the more recent paintings on today's list is Medusa by Caravaggio. We all know the story of Medusa, the woman with snakes for hair that when you look at, you turn to stone, and this is a painting that really captures her essence perfectly, as well as capturing a horrific moment. This painting was meant to be a depiction of the defeat of Medusa. The legend goes that Perseus, who is the son of Zeus and Danae, was given a shield by Athena. He took this shield to battle Medusa and managed to outsmart her by letting her catch a glimpse of her own reflection in the shield. She then turned herself to stone and this is when he took his sword and beheaded her. That is the moment this painting is portraying, the moment that Medusa was beheaded. I'm not sure if it really gets more cursed than that. This painting was created by Caravaggio in 1597 and it was actually his second of the kind, which is honestly kind of creepy. In our number six spot today, we have Hell. I'm not necessarily sure if I have to explain this one because the name really does speak for itself. This painting by Hans Memling was created in 1485 and it truly is terrifying. This is one of three double-sided panels that were created and it features a banner that reads, there is no redemption in hell. This painting features some sort of devil creature with fangs and bat-like wings and features and it has another entire face on its belly. Its hands and feet are claw-like and it is depicted stepping or dancing on the backs of people who are in the mouth of some sort of a beast, of course, engulfed in flames. This whole painting is absolutely terrifying, especially for those who believe in the existence of hell. It would be extremely interesting to know exactly where the inspirations for this piece came from, as it certainly is unlike anything I have ever seen before. In our number five spot today, we have the supernatural being. This painting was made by Katsushika Hakusai, and it belongs to the Japanese genre of art that is about supernatural beings, which are painted on wood blocks. The painting depicts a skeletal man Man who truly is straight out of a nightmare. The story behind this one is that it apparently is about an actor who was killed. The legend states that he actually ended up coming back to life like a zombie, and that is what this painting is about. Well, I guess it's more like a zombie ghost thing as he comes back to haunt his wife and the new man she has fallen in love with. This legend is already quite terrifying and the artist found a way to really bring that horror to life. His depiction of the sunken eyes and the horrifying grin with the clear representation of the thin skin and those spindly little fingers really make this painting what it is and that is a work of sheer terrifying art. In our number four spot today, we have the UFO. This painting comes from an unknown source from around 1350, and it is depicting the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, surrounded by a crowd of people with some extra special visitors. These visitors seem to be of the extraterrestrial variety. On either side of Jesus in the painting, there appears to be some sort of UFO that contains strange looking humans? It is very obvious that any sort of flying object during these times just did not exist, so the fact that it's one we as humans have never seen before is all the more interesting. Many people speculate that it is possible that these creatures may have been deities or perhaps angels, but there were no wings or halos or any other sign of angelic or divine features. It is possible that maybe humans have always been obsessed with the idea of alien life, and maybe the belief in UFO stems all the way back to them, but maybe this is a sign that aliens did visit Earth at some point long ago. Either way, it certainly is quite suspicious and a little bit creepy. In our number three spot today, we have the Lizard Hands. In 2002, in a cave discovered in the western deserts of Egypt, researchers found a ton of paintings on the walls thought to be dated back at least 8,000 years, if not longer. The paintings featured animals, humans, and sometimes headless creatures, which led to the cave being nicknamed the Cave of the Beasts, but there are also hundreds of handprints outlined, which are both very cool and very eerie. The most unusual part of the handprints, however, are the 13 that are extremely tiny. This would be endearing and very cute, 
cute, but what was once thought of as little tiny baby hands are actually not even human at all. An anthropologist realized this in 2006 when she saw that they were much too small and that the fingers were much too long. It is thought that these handprints may belong to lizards or perhaps baby crocodiles, but we still aren't really sure. It is definitely interesting and kind of fascinating to see all these handprints on the walls of the cave, but it definitely carries a mystery that we may never know the answers to. In our number two spot today, we have the Tomb of Roaring. In 2006, a grave robber who had been caught unveiled a secret in exchange for some leniency in his sentence. This secret is what unearthed this next cursed painting. He helped provide information that led to the unearthing of the Tomb of Roaring, which is one of the oldest tombs ever found in Europe. Inside the tomb were things like a sword, Greek vases, metal meat roasting spits, and a painting. This painting is one of the oldest in Europe and it is believed to have belonged to a warrior prince. The painting features what was originally thought to be lions, but it is now believed that they are probably deer or horses. I'm not sure about you guys, but unearthing a secret tomb with information given to you by a grave robber seems like a perfect recipe for something cursed, and I'm not sure if we should have opened that thing. Who knows what it could have unleashed on the world. In our number one spot today, we have the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is a painting that comes all the way from at least 7,000 years ago. This painting is the main part of a mural that is located in Utah's Horseshoe Canyon. The entire mural is huge as it is 300 feet long and features around 80 figures, and it was likely painted by ancient nomads. The technique used to create this image was by filling their mouths with red ochre tinted paint and spraying it out onto the sandstone. The paint was a mix of their blood and clay that was binded together by urine. This is all super cool and kind of gross, but here's the creepy thing. No one knows why these paintings were created or what they represent. Maybe they just like to paint, but it is kind of crazy to think about what this figure could have meant to them. Was it part of a legend? Was it something they saw in real life? This is just one of those mysteries that unfortunately is buried with the people of the past and we are just left to speculate exactly what this could be about. Starting off at our number 10 spot, we have this tomb painting. This painting is one of the oldest known Japanese paintings and it comes to us from a tomb which is both incredibly cool and terrifying. This tomb is called the Takamatsuzuka tomb which translates to something along the lines of the tall pine tree ancient burial mound. This tomb was thought to have been built sometime between the end of the 7th century and the beginning of the 8th century, but it wasn't discovered until the 1960s when a local farmer accidentally stumbled upon it. You might be wondering why I'm talking so much about this tomb when you came here for paintings, but it's because without the tomb there are no paintings. This painting is referred to as the beautiful women and is actually painted on the inside of the tomb walls. I'm not gonna lie, while it would be incredibly hard not to open a newfound mysterious tomb, it's just a risk I wouldn't personally take. Who knows what you'd be releasing into the world? This tomb is facing quick deterioration and the Cultural Affairs Agency of Japan is looking into breaking down the walls of the tomb to reconstruct them again in a place where the walls can be free from further damage and mold. This is proving to be a more difficult task than expected though and I can't help but feel like maybe this tomb doesn't want to be moved. In our number 9 spot today we have the cave painting. This painting is the oldest known painting in India and it was found on the walls and ceiling of a cave. It was originally believed that this painting was first created in the first century BCE and while there isn't any religious iconography in the paintings there are human figures fish elephants birds and different floral patterns it is said that another artist ended up drawing over the original which is an incredible shame and could have released some very angry vengeful energy on the world if the original artist is still somewhere out there watching to make matters even worse these paintings have been severely vandalized and a lot of the areas are in quite bad shape. There's something about things that are this old that makes me feel like they should just not be messed with at all. Not only because it's rude, but also because you never know who's watching. In our number eight spot today, we have Dante and Virgil in Hell. This terrifying work of art was created in 1850 and is currently on display in Paris. This painting is depicting a scene from Dante's Divine Comedy, which is basically about Dante being taken on a journey through hell with Virgil showing him the way. The painting is depicting a certain scene where Dante and Virgil are witnessing two damned souls intertwined in eternal combat. One of the souls was believed to be a heretic, which is how he landed in the underworld, and the other soul, who's biting his neck, 
was thought to be a man who falsely claimed another man's inheritance, which certainly is not a good thing to do. The painting also features some sort of terrifying creature flying in the background, as well as a lot more damned souls fighting in the fiery pits. This whole painting truly is both a stunning piece of art as well as an absolute nightmare. In our number 7 spot today we have The Death of Marat. The Death of Marat is a painting from 1793 by Jacques Louis David and it depicts the demise of French revolutionary leader Jean Paul Marat. The painting shows Jean Paul lying dead in his bathtub on July 13th, 1793 after Charlotte Corday took his life. The painting is regarded as one of the most important and famous images of the French Revolution. Charlotte snuck in to see Jean Paul by using a note which promised to share details of a counter revolutionary ring. Jean Paul suffered from a skin condition which left him in the bathtub often and it became a place where he usually worked. Charlotte stabbed Jean Paul in the bathtub but she did not attempt to run away and was later tried and executed for her actions. The painting shows Jean Paul holding a note which is of course written in French but translates to given that I am unhappy I have a right to ask for your help which is an incredibly eerie message. In our number 6 spot today we have Saturn devouring his son. This absolute nightmare fuel of a painting comes to us from around 1823 and is a depiction of one of the most famous stories in Greek mythology. This is the myth of Cronus whose name was romanized as Saturn and how he feared being overthrown by his children so instead of going to therapy to deal with whatever he had going on he just ate them all. It is said that this painting may have been inspired by another artist's earlier version and that one while also haunting and beautiful just doesn't hold the same absolutely horrific qualities as this one does. The first painting is a bit brighter and more of a conventional depiction while the one I'm talking about today just gives off pure psychotic energy. This painting shows Saturn eating his child with the head and one arm already consumed. The brightest parts of this painting are the flesh, the blood and Saturn's large bulging eyes. This painting is of course an amazing piece of art but I think we can all agree it is absolutely terrifying as well. In our number 5 spot today we have The Nightmare. The Nightmare was created in 1781 and there's a lot going on in this one. The painting shows a woman who is fast asleep with her arms thrown out below her which is all fine and well but there is also some sort of demon incubus sitting on her chest which is absolutely weird and not okay. The painting is said to display a woman dreaming and also the nightmare she is having which is such an eerie description. There are red velvet curtains hanging in the back with a creepy horse's head poking out of them which is also said to lend into the nightmare. The colors represent so much of what is going on in this painting with the sleeping woman being brightly colored and the rest of the painting being much darker in contrast. Because of what this painting really is getting at with the addition of the incubus, the painting has often been criticized as being too scandalous. In our number 4 spot today we have the guillotined heads. Well it really is all in the name with this one. This painting comes to us from 1814 and is showing us a pretty clear image of death and decay. The guillotine is definitely one of the scariest inventions from our past and this painting does not put it in any better of a light. The painting shows two decapitated heads, the one on the left being that of a female with her eyes closed and her skin pale white. The head of the right is a male's and things get a lot more gruesome with him. You can see the jagged marks on the skin of the neck where you can really just get a sense for how harsh this type of punishment really was. With both his mouth and eyes open, the artist was able to capture the bone chilling lifeless expression on his face. Apparently the artist would really keep guillotined body parts so that he would be able to paint them with an accurate likeness which is both incredible dedication and very very creepy. I wonder if we are looking at the real face of someone who suffered this horrible punishment. In our number 3 spot today we have the judgement of Cambyses. This painting was created in 1498 and 1499 and it depicts a pretty gruesome scene. It is one of very few paintings from the artist that doesn't depict some sort of religious theme which is interesting considering the fact that he went so far off the religious track with this one. The painting is showing the arrest and subsequent gruesome flaying of a corrupt judge surrounded by a crowd of people. This piece was actually commissioned by municipal authorities as a piece to be hung in the executive of the city's room in the town hall. I'm not sure what is scarier, 
this painting in general, or the fact that someone commissioned such a horrifying scene. Either way, this painting is definitely best viewed from afar. In our number two spot today, we have the Massacre of the Innocents. This painting is basically exactly as the title would suggest, unfortunately. This painting is actually two separate paintings which were created in the early 1600s. They're depicting a scene from the biblical massacre of the innocents of Bethlehem as related to the Gospel of Matthew 2:13 to 18. This story sees Herod the Great, king of Judea, ordering the execution of all male children two years old or younger in the vicinity of Bethlehem. Since this painting is showing that, it is an absolutely horrifying scene with many helpless individuals being well, massacred. The first of the two paintings actually ended up being lost for quite some time, but was luckily later rediscovered and now resides in the Art Gallery of Ontario. We've seen a lot of creepy paintings today, but in my personal opinion, this one might take the cake in being absolutely bone chilling to look at. In our number one spot today, we have The Anguished Man. This is a painting that holds many secrets, the first two being when and who created it. This painting comes from an unknown source and is absolutely eerie. It depicts exactly what the name would suggest, a man looking like he is in great pain and suffering. The painting is apparently made of a mix of paint and blood, and it is said that the creator ended up taking his own life after making it. Because of the unknown origins and this little tale that goes along with it, the painting already gives off some extremely eerie energy, but if that wasn't enough, the man who currently owns the painting claims that it is haunted. He even uploads YouTube videos of the strange happenings around the painting, and it is said that sometimes whispers can be heard coming from it. Whatever is going on with that painting, it sure can't be good. Starting off this countdown, we have the Fairy Feller's Master Stroke. The Fairy Feller's Master Stroke is Richard Dad's most famous Baroque painting. It's quite beautiful at first glance with all the flowers and intricate details. But turns out that Richard painted this while incarcerated in a state criminal lunatic asylum. In 1843, he suffered a psychotic episode, which ended in him brutally killing his father with a razor and five inch knife. He then proceeded to hide the body and flee to France. But while fleeing, he tried to kill a fellow coach passenger and was arrested and brought back to England. And then he was locked away after telling authorities he was instructed to kill his dad by the Egyptian god Osiris. Moving on at number nine, we have the Charnel House. This is a piece created by none other than Pablo Picasso. It was first exhibited in 1946, and it is a very abstract piece. Well, turns out that the piece actually depicts a Spanish family that had been killed in their own kitchen. Picasso saw footage of this in a black and white documentary and was left shocked, to say the least. If you look at this piece, the lack of color is intended to symbolize the feeling of witnessing such violence on film. The longer and closer you stare at this image, the more you can interpret it. You can see the kitchen counter with the dishes up above, while a number of bodies lay on the floor below. That's what makes this painting very unsettling. At first you're like, whoa, what is this that I'm looking at? And then you're given the gruesome backstory, and then all of a sudden the abstract shapes form images. In our eighth spot, we have the Cross Country Killer drawing. This next piece of artwork features a cloaked figure holding a set of scales, while a two-headed dragon casually chills below it. I'll leave it up to you for interpretation. Now, this cartoon cartoonish piece of work was actually created by Glenn Edward Rogers, otherwise known as the Cross Country Killer or the Casanova Killer. He's an American serial killer that was convicted of two murders, but suspected of many more. In fact, he admitted to killing 70 people, but later he was like, nah, I'm just playing. I didn't kill that many people. So we really don't know his true kill count. Fun fact, if you want to buy this piece of work, you can. It's currently on sale for $200 literally just because of who drew it. I don't know about you, but I do not want my home decorated by pieces made by serial killers. No thank you. Moving on at number seven, we have Christine's World. This piece of art was created in 1948 by Andrew Wyeth and features a young girl laying on the grass staring at a big home in the distance. Now, there's nothing necessarily sad or dark about this painting, right? Well, wrong. This painting is of Christina Olsen, a neighbor of Andrew, who was sadly unable to walk. As a young girl, she developed 
developed a degenerative muscle condition, possibly polio, but it was never diagnosed. This left her unable to walk, but she refused to use a wheelchair. Instead, she would crawl everywhere. This painting reflects the struggles she encounters on a daily basis. For example, her being so far from her home might symbolize how disconnected she feels with her abled family. It also highlights how it would be hard for her to travel great distances, as she would have to drag her body across that field to get home. With all this in mind, it really changes how you see this painting. At least it did for me. Moving on to number six, we have Bernardo de Galvez, aka one of the most haunted paintings in the world. This is a portrait of Bernardo de Galvez, a very powerful Spanish military leader. In the early 1900s, the city of Galveston opened a hotel named after him, and in the hotel, they hung this massive portrait of him. Shortly after, spooky things began to happen, and people realized that Bernardo has attached himself to his portrait. A lot of guests have seen his ghost wandering the halls by his portrait. Others complained about feeling very unsettled while passing the painting. Others say that the area around the painting is always very cold. The creepiest thing is that if you try to take a photo of the portrait, it will end up coming out blurry or just completely dark. Your photos will continue to turn out blurry unless you ask Bernardo if it's okay to take a photo of him. Once you get his permission, then you can take a picture of the portrait and it should come out clear. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the approaching storm. This painting is quite unique due to the fact that the top of the canvas is actually carved out, giving it kind of a 3D look. The painting has been named the small pine and barn with approaching storm painting. It's a very original title. Now, what's the big deal about this painting, you ask? Well, it was created by serial killer Jeremy Jones. Jeremy claimed to have taken the lives of 21 women in five different states over the course of 12 years. He was finally caught in 2004 after he killed his neighbor and set her home on fire. And this is another painting that you can purchase if you want art done by a gruesome killer in your home. If you do, it's yours for $625. Moving on to number four, we have Frida Kahlo. Frida Kahlo was a Mexican painter most famous for her self-portraits featuring her iconic monobrow. But what many people don't know is that she had a very tragic life. At six years old, she contracted polio that affected her right leg. As she got older, she developed a permanent limp. Then as a teen, she was injured in a terrible bus accident, during which one of the bus's iron handrails impaled her through her pelvis. As a result, she was unable to have children. A number of her paintings highlight her tragedies, including the broken column painting. This painting depicts how she felt after that bus accident. It features Frida with a metal rod in place of her spine. Not only that, but you might notice that in a number of her paintings, she's surrounded by monkeys. While monkeys were her favorite animal, and in her paintings, they represent the children that she was never able to have. Now how depressing is that? In our third spot, we have Black Triptychs. Black Triptychs are a series of three paintings created by Francis Bacon between 1972 to 1974. They feature a series of blurry abstract men. These paintings were actually inspired by Bacon's lover's death. George Dyer was Bacon's muse and lover. Sadly, he took his own life and Bacon fell into a dark hole. These paintings show views from the moments before, during, and after Dyer's death. After his death, Bacon painted him obsessively, often showcasing how distraught he was by his death. So what you're looking at in this painting is literally a death scene painted by a heartbroken and traumatized artist. In our second spot, we have The Lovers. With a name like The Lovers, maybe you're expecting a cute, brightly colored painting featuring two happy people in love. Well, not even close, I'm sorry. This is a painting completed by Renee Magritte and features a couple kissing with white sheets over their faces. In fact, these paintings were inspired by her mother who took her life when Renee was only 13. Her mother jumped into a river and drowned herself. Renee saw her get pulled out of the water and noticed that her mother's nightgown had slipped over her face covering it. This traumatizing image of her dead mother inspired this piece of work. For years, she was haunted by this image of her mother. Now, how dark and depressing is that one? It just keeps getting worse and worse, guys. And in our number one spot today, we have the severed heads. 
And just like the painting's name suggests, it features two severed heads. Now this piece was painted by artist Theodore Jericho, who is known for his dark and scary paintings. It features a woman's recently decapitated head next to a man's decaying head. Clearly, he's been dead for more time than her. Now, here's what makes this painting even more messed up. Theodore was so obsessed with death that apparently he kept real dismembered body parts and cadavers in his studio. So the heads we see in the painting were real heads he had in his studio that he drew. He obtained the male's head after it had been chopped off by a guillotine. How great is that? Number 10, Madam X. We'll kick off this part two with a scandalous painting. Oh my, yes, shield your eyes, young ones. We got spaghetti straps coming in hot. This painting was deemed too scandalous back in the day. Madam X, the portrait of Virginie Amélie Avignot Gautreau, originally painted back in 1884 by John Singer Sargent. Now at first, John made the woman's straps sliding off her shoulder, a little, you know, a little, ooh, my lovely jewel strap is, ooh, slipped off, ooh. Apparently that was too scandalous for the upper class society around him back then, so John had to repaint the straps back on. Yeah, backlash was still so strong after John had sold the painting that he moved. The guy left Paris because of spaghetti straps. Are you kidding? What have we done? Art, he's so good, and we pushed him away. Come paint me like one of your fine French gals. Paint all the straps on me, I don't care. On or off, what's up, let's party. Number nine, Hidden Beached Whale. Look closely at this 1641 landscape from Henrik van and Thonison. This masterpiece here is titled View of Skeveningen Sands. Yeah, it's a nice one. It's pretty cold of a day. I wouldn't go to the beach personally. Do you notice anything out of the ordinary in this painting? Anything at all catching your eye? What's everyone looking at here, you know? Art is so mysterious. So many questions in this one painting. I just, I feel like we're missing something here, you know? Like just something in this painting. What about now? Yeah, there was a beached whale in that painting the entire time, and we didn't know until 2014. How amazing is that? At some point after it had been completed, the work of art was painted over. So for hundreds of years, somebody was looking at this wondering what the meaning was. He's like, why are they all on the beach? What are they looking at? It was a beached whale this whole time. It was haunting the entire time to look at. Someone didn't like that. You know what, rightfully so. I would have painted over that whale too. No, I wouldn't have. It's a fabulous painting. I would have never touched that. Number eight, David and Goliath. We of course have to look at some of the artwork of the Sistine Chapel that's loaded with history. Fun history, some would say. A panel that shows David and Goliath specifically, or rather it shows David about to defeat the Goliath. Michelangelo added a hidden message in this one painting. The stance that David is making looks heroic. He's got, you know, athletic stance for sure to, you know, do some bad stuff right away. But his stance is in the shape of a Hebrew letter, the letter Gimel, which refers to reward and punishment. Good thing it wasn't Resh or else he wouldn't have won the battle. His arm would be all the way over here. He'd be like that. Wouldn't have won at all. These are like Easter eggs in famous paintings. So far, I'm loving this. And if you're enjoying the content as well, hit that thumbs up. Let us know, then we can do more art for you. Let's move on. Number seven, hidden self-portrait. In George Surratt's painting of a woman powdering herself, there's a window in the top left corner. And me, personally, I would have gone with, you know, the sun. But George here, at first, he went with a self-portrait. A little selfie. This was odd behavior though, historically, for this artist because he wasn't known for painting self-portraits, ever. This was the only time it happened. Thanks to the Courtauld Gallery in London and a few x-rays, now we can make out the first draft of this 19th century painting. The portrait does resemble a photo of George as well. We compared them both, so we're definitely able to confirm that's him. He did at least one self-portrait. That's pretty historical. I'm, I'm glad we found it. X-rays were actually done back in 1958 and 1987, but the machine could only detect a layer of paint, not the actual image, if there was one. Pointillism is so impressive. I tried it one summer and was absolute garbage. Number six, Garden of Earthly Delights. This this piece was done back in the late 15th century. Painter Hieronymus Bosch had a lot going on in this one, that's for sure. There's a group of naked people eating a big strawberry. There's a mermaid riding a fish. This one's got a lot of wacky stuff on it. We love it. In 2014, a hidden message was found on somebody's butt. Yeah, I'm not joking. There's actual like music notes drawn across somebody's bottom. Uh, so a college student translated it and now you can listen to it. You can listen to that guy's butt. That little melody Bosch was humming to himself while he was painting sounded like this. Yeah, well, it's not gonna be stuck in our heads anytime soon, but it's still fun to hear art come to life, you know? Number five, the starry night. We had Van Gogh in part one, Cafe Terrace at night, so naturally, we have to throw him in part two as well. The only time we've seen Vincent Van Gogh as a time traveler was in Doctor Who, but 
How did Vincent Van Gogh know about turbulent flow decades before scientists even knew about it? Yeah, that's the question we're trying to answer here on MA10. The Starry Night was painted back in 1889, but in 2004, NASA observed a distant star where dust and gas were swirling around the cosmos. It reminded NASA of Van Gogh's work, so they looked into his art a bit more, and mathematically, his artwork mirrors natural turbulence. This was also at a time where Van Gogh's mental health was not A-OK, -okay, so how he was able to get the math is accurate that long ago, and also via art, is mind-blowing. Number four, Bacchus. Michelangelo Caravaggio, okay. His 1595 painting, Bacchus, looks pretty calm at first. The god of wine and being a tipsy, a personal favorite god of mine, if I may. It's currently in the Fizi Gallery in Florence, and it wasn't until 2009 where, you guessed it, they found a hidden image. In the Carav of Wine, on the bottom left of the painting, there is a self-portrait of Caravaggio. We can't see it with our eyes, but technology, once again, has our back here. There's a tiny little head reflected on the wine jug. Maybe, it just looks like a smudge at first, but with the help of radio diagnostic investigation, we can see the bigger slash smaller picture. We can see a man with his arms stretched out, the world's smallest selfie for the win. Number three, The Last Supper. We've all seen this one at some point, I'm confident. If you haven't, Look at this, isn't that amazing? I'm glad I was able to show you this. The Last Supper, painted by Leonardo da Vinci in the late 15th century, has been the talk of many towns. In this painting, we see John the Apostle, and it's been debated that it's actually Mary in disguise. I know, don't tell anyone. And that V-shape in between Jesus and John represents the female womb. That was in Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code. I didn't make that up. If I made that up, I wouldn't be here, that's crazy. But another secret could be lying in plain view this whole time right on the table. In 2007, an Italian musician found hidden musical notes in this painting. Musical notes hiding in bread rolls and in the hand of the apostles. We have two musical messages in this video, that's crazy. This makes me want to look for more clues in paintings. Let me just go look at some butts on art for a bit. Any notes on butts? What does that one say, it's an E minor? No. I'm gonna start looking at more musical notes on butts of all the paintings. I'm gonna try and find one. That one's kind of an E flat, you know? E flat. That's how we do it. Number two, the separation of light from darkness. This one's another anatomical one. Makes me feel weird. Once I saw it, I couldn't unsee it. I'm not gonna lie to you. The separation of light from darkness, Michelangelo again. Michelangelo was featured on part one, the creation of Adam. It's definitely an iconic piece. But once you see the hidden organs in that painting, it changes you for a bit, you know? This one as well, another iconic piece from Michelangelo seen in the Sistine Chapel. We have the central figure, God, surrounded by four others. What we often miss though is the spinal cord that runs up God's chest. It's like one of those hidden object books, only the art is beautiful and the objects are gross. I'm like, oh, it's a spinal cord. That's found it. And finally, number one, the lady in the grass. We'll end this part two on another piece by Van Gogh. Patch of Grass was a Van Gogh classic done in 1887, and upon first glance, the painting appears to be, well, nothing more than just that, a patch of grass. But it's beautiful and it's art, so naturally we'll look at it for too long. Oh, it's just the wall? That's not art. I thought it was the grass. That's just the wall. This one doesn't contain any deep space mathematics by any means, but in 2008, Dutch researchers used an x-ray, took a deeper look into the grass, and found the portrait of a woman. How haunting is that of a discovery? Imagine being the first person to find that. That's really scary. That's a horror movie. Around one third of Van Gogh's artwork has old paintings underneath it. He would often paint over his stuff. We're only recently finding them, which is exciting. Scientist George Deke of the Delft University of Technology, he's literally peeling back layers of paint history digitally. The painting right now hangs in the Dutch eastern city, Aturlo, in the Kroller Mueller Museum. So next time you take a look at this masterpiece, just know that there's a woman's face looking back at you. And while you're watching this video, just know I'm actually looking back at you right now too. Isn't that creepy? Art, digital art, still art. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Hunting Cave painting. This painting comes to us from an astonishing 44,000 years ago and was found on the wall of a cave on an Indonesian island. Researchers were able to date this painting that far back due to the fact that the cave it was found in is still a living cave, which means that rock formations have been growing over the painting, and by being able to date those, they know it is at least 43,900 years old, but it could potentially be even older. The painting features what looks like a hunting scene with four wild pigs, some small buffalo, and a group of really small hunters with spears. The strange thing about these hunters, other than their size, is the fact that they're all human and animal hybrids. They all have elongated faces like an animal snout, and a lot of them have tails. There is even one tiny, 
human thing that has a beak. We don't really know why they depicted the hunters this way or why the animals are so much larger than them. There also were no other usual signs of human life found in the cave, such as bones or hunting tools. So this cave may have acted as some sort of special or sacred spot for them, and while it definitely holds a lot of secrets, we may never get the chance to know most of them. In our number 9 spot today, we have lizard hands. In 2002, in a cave discovered in the western deserts of Egypt, researchers found tons of paintings on the walls, thought to be dated back at least 8,000 years, if not even longer. The paintings feature animals, humans, and sometimes headless creatures, which led to the cave being nicknamed the Cave of the Beasts. But there are also hundreds of handprints outlined, which are both very cool and very eerie. The most unusual of the handprints, however, are the 13 that are extremely tiny. This would be endearing and very cute, but what was once thought of as tiny little baby hands are actually not even human at all. An anthropologist realized this in 2006 when she discovered that they were much too small and the fingers were much too long. It is thought that these handprints may belong to lizards or perhaps baby crocodiles, but we still aren't really sure. It is definitely interesting and kind of fascinating to see all of these handprints on the walls of the cave, but it definitely carries a mystery that we may never know the answers to. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Magura Cave. This is a cave that is actually one of the largest in Bulgaria, and it is located in the northwest area of the country. This cave is filled with prehistoric paintings that date back somewhere between 8,000 and 4,000 years ago. Through the research into this cave, around 700 drawings have been found on the walls, and they depict a wide variety of scenes. These paintings were created using bat excrement. I mean, you're in a cave. You've got to make do with the resources you have. It's not like they could just walk over to Michael's and grab a brand new paint set. The paintings mostly depict different hunting scenes, as well as scenes of people dancing and celebrating. Honestly, I just wish for one day that I could understand the mind of an early human and understand what these paintings were meant to symbolize. Maybe it was meant to show something and maybe they just liked art. Who knows for sure. In our number 7 spot today, we have the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is a painting that comes all the way from at least 7,000 years ago. The painting is the main part of a mural that is located in Utah's Horseshoe Canyon. I know, it's not exactly a cave, but it's close and it's a cool ancient painting. The entire mural is huge as it is 300 feet long and features around 80 figures, and it was likely painted by ancient nomads. The techniques they used to create this image was by filling their mouths with red ochre tinted paint and then spraying it out onto the sandstone. This is all super cool to learn about, but here's the kind of creepy thing. No one knows why these paintings were created or what they represent. It is possible that maybe they just like to paint, but it is kind of crazy to think about what this figure could have meant to them. Was it part of a legend? Was it something they saw in real life? Was it a prediction of things to come? This is just one of those mysteries that unfortunately is buried with the people of the past, and we are just left to speculate exactly what this could be about. In our number 6 spot today, we have the Brazil Caves. This is an interesting cave painting because of the fact that it is widely debated when exactly it was created. The Serra de Capivara National Park is located in eastern Brazil, and it is the home to a bunch of different rock shelters that are decorated with incredible and elaborate cave paintings. This area includes scenes of rituals, hunting, trees, and animals, and some scientists believe that the oldest of the paintings dates back to at least 25,000 years ago. There are others who debate this because that would go against what we currently believe is the date of human settlement in the Americas, but hey, we weren't there, so who knows? In our number 5 spot today, we have the vandalized cave painting. This painting is the oldest known painting in India, and it was found on the walls and ceiling of the Sitana Vassal Cave. It was originally believed that this painting was first created in the 1st century BCE. The paintings depict things like human figures, fish, elephants, birds, and different floral patterns. It is said that another artist ended up drawing over the original, which is an incredible shame and truly just rude. These paintings have been severely vandalized, and a lot of the areas are in quite bad shape. There's something about things that are this old that makes me feel like they should just not be messed with at all. Not only because it's rude, but also because you just never know what kind of things they may hold. In our number 4 spot today, we have the droughts. Ancient drawings and writings were found covering the walls of the Dayu Cave, which is located in central China, and a lot of them detail different droughts and such that were experienced during the time of the writing. According to these drawings, people would come to the cave for 
for either water or to pray for rain in times of drought. The writings reveal some of the horrors that the people of the time experienced while going through these periods of drought, including severe starvation, social instability, and conflict between government and citizens. While these cave writings show us a different time in history, while these cave writings show us a difficult time in history, researchers say that these stalagmites are formed by dripping water and they form rings, sort of like how trees do, and these rings can give us insights into different things. Based on the patterns of these rings, scientists were able to corroborate the things that the cave writings were saying, but they were also able to make a grim prediction for the future, which is unfortunately that this region may again see one of these catastrophic droughts, this time in the late 2030s. In our number 3 spot today we have Daydreaming. The paintings at the Lascaux Caves are perhaps some of the most famous ancient cave paintings of all time. They date back to some 17,000 years ago, and a lot of the art seen on the walls of the cave is art that depicts animals, about 900 of them, with 605 being pretty identifiable. There are cattle, bison, some wild cats, bears, birds, but there's one weird thing. There's no reindeer, and there were definitely reindeer in the area at the time, and there's evidence that reindeer meat was used for food, so why didn't they draw any? Well, our best theory as to why is that perhaps these drawings and paintings are depicting animals that the humans at the time were daydreaming of. The animals that were too fast or too strong or that they didn't have effective weapons for. The drawings showing what life could be like if only these humans had more. Does that sound familiar to any of us? Because I think it definitely should. In our number 2 spot today we have Astronomy Masters. This is a point that doesn't discuss just one cave painting in particular, but it's something that has been seen throughout many that have been discovered, and even in some of the oldest ever found. What I'm talking about is the early humans and their complex understanding of astronomy. A common theme among ancient cave paintings is the depiction of animals, but what was previously thought of as just a drawing is now being realized that instead of just animal symbols, they may actually be used to represent star constellations in the night sky, and the paintings of them may be used to represent dates or mark events such as comet strikes. I mean, for a second, imagine being an early human having no concept of science and looking at the night sky with no light pollution. It totally makes sense why they would try and keep track of these things, not to mention how terrifying would a comet or meteor be when you have no idea what they are. Researchers have been able to find thousands of sites and symbols that span through thousands of years that seem to be using the same sophisticated level of astronomy. It is likely that this understanding is exactly why human migration and navigation of the open seas was possible. Their brilliance truly was crucial to how we evolved as humans. In our number one spot today we have Las Gaul. Las Gaul is a complex of caves and different rock shelters that are located in northwestern Somalia. These caves and rock shelters contain some of the earliest known art in the Horn of Africa, and really just on the continent in general, which is quite the feat considering the rich history of humans in Africa. I mean, it's where we evolved into humans after all. These prehistoric cave paintings show cows in ceremonial robes accompanied by humans. They show domesticated dogs and even a giraffe, which I personally love. These paintings are actually very well preserved, which is fantastic, and they retain clear outlines and vibrant colors, which really gives us a clearer look into the lives of the people who created them. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the Neanderthal art. Back in 2018, it was announced that one of the oldest ever known cave paintings made by Neanderthals was found in the Spanish caves of La Pasiega, Maltaviso, and Ardales. This art is said to be around 64,000 years old, and to be honest, it's quite abstract, which may not be all that surprising. Archaeologists found things like drawings of ladder-like lines, hand stencils, and a stalagmite structure decorated with ochre. It is thought that the Neanderthals that created this art left it in a location that they viewed as special. I mean, many of the hand stencils appear in this smaller, hard-to-reach area area of the cave, which means that the person who made them would have had to prepare not only the pigment but also some sort of source of light prior to entering the cave. It was certainly a deliberate act. My favorite thing about this art though is the symbolism. It is said that, quote, the significance of the painting is not to know that Neanderthals could paint, it's the fact that they were engaging in symbolism, and that's probably related to an ability to have language. Like, basically this was almost their way of communicating. This this was their way of leaving behind a story. I don't know. 
I just think that's very cool and also a very important stepping stone in terms of early language development. It is said that researchers are looking into the acoustics of the area now where the cave art is located because they are interested to see whether the placement of the art had anything to do with the sounds people could make or hear in the particular spot. In our number 9 spot today we have the Bimbetka rock shelters. There are a collection of rock shelters that are known in central India known as the Bimbetka and they contain over 600 different paintings that span through the prehistoric Paleolithic and Mesolithic periods which is truly unbelievable. The oldest of all of the paintings that can be found here is thought to date back to around 12,000 years ago. The paintings here are basically what you'd expect as it reflects the sort of lives around the people who made them. The paintings show us a glimpse into what their lives looked like and they also show an array of animals that these people crossed such as tigers, lions, and crocodiles. One really exceptional thing about this art is that it shows us the sort of transition into the stone age that these people had. The art moves from depicting dances and rituals to hunting scenes with the tools that they were able to create. It gives us just a tiny glimpse into the evolution of humankind in that area all those years ago. In our number 8 spot today we have the Tadvart Akakis. Probably said that horribly wrong. <laughs> This is a mountain range that is located in the Sahara Desert of western Libya, and I guess the art is more rock art than cave art, but I mean, it's all incredibly fascinating regardless of where the rocks reside. Some of the art that can be found here is said to date back to at least 14,000 years ago, and most of the paintings or carvings are of animals that were in the area, such as giraffes, elephants, ostriches, and camels, but also of men and horses. The art found here was created over quite a span of time which gives us a remarkable insight into the changes that happened throughout these years. The changes in the fauna and flora but also the changes in the way of life of those who made them. They showed the differences of the different populations that ended up succeeding each other in the area and region of the Sahara. In our number 7 spot today we have Uber. This location is a group of rock outcrops that are located in the Kekadu National Park which is a protected area in the Northern Territory of Australia. This location is likely to have become the site that it is due to the large rock overhangs which would have provided the perfect shelter for the indigenous people of the land for thousands of years. It's super cool to think about why these early humans chose these specific spots for their art and I mean this one totally makes sense. Some of the art here is said to be 20,000 years old and most of it depicts different animals such as catfish, snake necked turtles, pig nosed turtles, rock haunting ringtail possums, wallabies, and even a Tasmanian tiger. Tiger. Along with the extensive amount of rock art that could be seen here, there is also art that was found that was painted on the skeletons of animals in the area too, which is absolutely captivating and very intriguing. In our number 6 spot today we have the Altamira cave. This cave is located in Spain and it was renowned for the prehistoric art that it features. There are charcoal drawings and polychrome paintings that show some more contemporary and local fauna as well as human hands. This art is striking and it truly is incredible, but another reason why this art is so exceptional is the fact that it was the first European cave paintings for which prehistoric origin was suggested. Many people disputed this for quite a while because it was thought that prehistoric humans weren't capable of abstract thought, but this was later disproved by similar art found years later that showed that it is absolutely possible that the early humans had these sort of capabilities. It is said that the earliest of the paintings found here can date back to the Upper Paleolithic period 36,000 years ago. In our number 5 spot today we have hand and footprints. Quite recently a team of international scientists uncovered a pair of ancient hand and footprints that really changed our way of thinking and our understanding of early cave art. These impressions were discovered at the Tibetan plateau and are thought to be somewhere between 169,000 to 226,000 years old, making them quite possibly the oldest art ever discovered. What's more is that that they believe that this art was actually made by children. These hand and foot impressions appear to have been placed intentionally on an area of soft travertine, which is a form of terrestrial limestone. This travertine was deposited by water from what is now an inactive hot spring, but over time as the travertine transformed into stone, it preserved these small hand and footprints. You might be wondering how we can determine hand and footprints as art, but experts say that we can determine this because the traces were not made during normal movement movement or to stabilize motion and because quote care appears to have been taken with the composition they qualify as an early act 
of cave art. In our number four spot today, we have the Romanelli cave art. This art was found quite recently in the Romanelli cave, which is located in Italy. The first art in this cave was discovered more than 100 years ago, so these newer findings of this Stone Age art really is quite the discovery. This cave is located on Italy's southeast coast and is just seven meters above the Adriatic Sea, which has made exploration of the cave quite difficult in the past. There was actually a collapse that happened inside of the cave, which created more difficulties in the search. Through excavation of the cave, researchers have found deposits of animal bones, a small quantity of human bones, and several portable art objects, such as stone fragments, and of course, the thing we're all here for today, just the art. The art that was found here includes a bovid, some geometric patterns which were made using quote moon milk, which is a soft white material that builds up in limestone caves, and art that depicts a bird, which is rare as birds were not usually depicted in the art that was normally found in the area during this time. The discovery gave some very valuable insights as the fact that some of the images are layered over one another has shown that this cave was used for a much longer period of time than what was previously thought. In our number three spot today, we have the cave of El Castillo. The cave of the castle is a stone age rock shelter that is located in Spain and it holds some of the oldest cave paintings we have ever found. The most notable of all of the art found here is referred to as the gallery of hands which is a panel of abstract signs and hand stencil rock art that has been dated back to around 39,000 years ago. The lengthy cave holds over 100 different images such as several rock engravings of deer as well as images of other animals that would have been in the area like bison goats, horses, and aurochs, which are a now extinct species. There are even images found in the cave of dogs, which is actually extremely rare in prehistoric cave art. Right now, it is debated whether it was Neanderthals that were responsible for this cave art, or if it was Homo sapiens after all, and to be honest, I mean, it could go either way. In our number two spot today, we have the Fumain Cave. The cave art that exists here is an important source of art that was created during the Upper Paleolithic period, and this cave is home to some of the oldest stone art that can be found in Italy. Many of these paintings were created using red ochre, and it includes, of course, depictions of animals, but also of sort of half-animal, half-human hybrids, which may symbolize some sort of belief system or perhaps even mythology that existed at the time. It's hard for us to say for sure, but it certainly is a reflection of some sort of belief system that existed at the time. This is not only some of the oldest figurative cave art that can be found, but it also helped us to shed light on the contributions of both Neanderthals and modern man to Stone Age art during this time period. According to Alberto Broglio, professor of paleontology at the University of Ferrara, evidence obtained from this cave shows that there was a clean break between Neanderthal and modern humans, both in their culture and and their lifestyle. In our number one spot today, we have the Chevette Cave. This cave is located in southern France and it contains some of the best and most well preserved cave paintings that have been discovered to date, which truly is incredible. It isn't quite clear exactly when these paintings were made, and that's actually quite a source of debate among experts. It is known, however, that this cave definitely holds some of the oldest discovered cave paintings, some of which are thought to possibly be 30,000 years old. Most of these paintings consist of different animals animals, and there are actually no complete human figures seen here. There are a few panels of red ochre handprints and hand stencils, and a ton of abstract lines and dots that can be found throughout the cave. I could honestly talk about these specific cave paintings for an entire video, they're so interesting. One drawing seen here, which was later overlaid with a drawing of a deer, is sort of reminiscent of a volcano spewing lava, which was similar to the regional volcanoes that were active at the time, and if confirmed, this would represent the earliest known drawing of a volcanic eruption. Not only this, but those who created the art here used techniques that are very rarely seen in any other cave art. Like, they scraped the walls of debris before starting so as to give them a more blank canvas to work on. That's simply amazing. In our number 10 spot, we have The Last Supper. Okay, so this one I think a lot of you might have expected to be on my list as it is known from the book The Da Vinci Code by author Dan Brown and he pointed out an incredible secret that to this day people are still pondering about. 
Is Mary Magdalene sitting beside Jesus in the Last Supper painting, or is that John the Apostle? And if it is not John the Apostle, then why was he painted so feminine, whereas everyone else is clearly a man in that painting? Some say Da Vinci painted him feminine because other painters before him did. This will continue to be of much speculation, but another secret that has actually been found within this painting was found by Italian computer technician Giovanni Maria. Paula, and he claims that inside the painting there are musical notes, and if played from left to right, they create a 40 second hymn that sounds like a requiem. In our number nine spot, we have the young woman powdering herself. This is a painting done by George Surratt between 1889 to 1890. This looks like an innocent painting of a woman just, you know, putting on her foundation for the day, maybe doing a little 1800s equivalent to contouring and finishing it off with a nice red lip. Anyways, there's a lot more going on with this painting than you may think. Recent x-rays have revealed that the flower in the top corner of the painting was actually once a self portrait of George. Apparently he covered it up because he was told that it was bizarre. Apparently it's even more notable because the woman in this painting was his mistress. So it would make sense that she would have a portrait of him hanging in her room. Ooh, secrets and lies. I doubt the ugliness of your portrait was the only reason you covered it up, George. Probably because the missus didn't know about your mistress. Naughty. <laughs> in our number eight spot, we have Supper at Emos. This is a painting that was made by Caravaggio in 1601. This painting is depicting Jesus with, we can assume to be his disciples, and they are sitting at a table with tons of food and fruit. At first glance, you might not see it, but if you look at the shadow of the fruit basket, you will see that the shadow is in the shape of a fish. People believe that this is a little purposeful Easter egg done by the painter, and that the fish is alluding to the story of Jesus feeding the masses with fish. Honestly, that makes sense, but he could have just put fish on the table. That doesn't need to be a secret in a shadow, but perhaps for fun, I guess I can see the appeal. In our number seven spot, we have David and Goliath. This is the David and Goliath painting that is in the Sistine Chapel that shows David defeating Goliath the giant. This painting was of course painted by none other than Michelangelo in 1509. This painting is already pretty spectacular, but apparently there is also a little hidden symbol within the painting. The way that David is standing over Goliath, his stance, is perfectly in the shape of the Hebrew letter Gimel. The letter is supposed to represent reward and punishment, which of course works perfectly with what happens in this story. In our number six spot, we have the topsy-turvy world. This is an oil painting that is also known as the Blue Clock by Peter Bruegel, the Elder, done in 1559. This painting is so chaotic. It's hard to know what to focus on because there's so much happening and apparently it's on purpose. Within this painting are 112 proverbs acted out, which are basically small statements that express truth about human behavior based on common sense or experience. Two that I could make out and thought were easy to see were swimming against the tide or banging one's head against a brick wall. 110 more to go. <laughs> Could be here all night. Let me know if you see any in the comment section below. In our number five spot, we have Patch of Grass by Van Gogh. The 1887 painting Patch of Grass is one of many paintings apparently by Van Gogh where another work of art has been found hidden behind the painting. In 2008, two scientists by the name of Joris Dick and Quan Janssens discovered an x-ray technique that helped them reveal a portrait of a peasant woman buried under the blades of the grass. The woman looks quite sad, so maybe that's why he decided to cover her up. Although apparently Van Gogh was known for reusing his paper due to not having a lot of supplies and money, so they have found a lot of paintings within his paintings over the years. 
pretty awesome. In our number four spot, we have The Old Guitarist. This is a classic Pablo Picasso painting done in the early 1900s. It is known for its haunting vibe due to the way that the old man is hunched over playing his guitar just like this. <laughs> oh, just lovey. He also is quite white and ghostly. In 1998, an infrared camera revealed that there is actually another painting layered underneath this painting that features a woman. Apparently, as this painting begins to fade, it has become easier to see the woman's face above the guitar player's neck. Honestly, the woman looks a lot more pleasant than this man. Perhaps that is why he is so ghostly and sad because he is thinking of her. Perhaps she was always intended to be there. She is a ghost that is within him in the afterlife. Okay, who knows, but that would be pretty cool if true. In our number three spot, we have the creation of Adam. This one is more cool than bizarre, I think, but you can decide. This is the beautiful creation of Adam painting done by none other than Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel. This is yet another painting where he had a hidden illustration within the painting, and personally, I think it is so cool. In this painting, you see God reaching for Adam to give him life, we all know the story. But if you look at God and what is surrounding him, you'll actually see that it's an anatomical illustration of a human brain, which could show that Michelangelo intended to show that God gave Adam life, but also human knowledge. Whoa, mind blown, it makes sense. <laughs> In our number two spot, we have Madonna with Saint Giovannino. This is a painting made by Domenico Girolandio around 1440. 1494. This is a painting that has not actually become quite popular over the years because of its intended purpose. It's become popular because of the flying object that appears to be in the top right of the painting behind Madonna. Some believe it to be the first depiction of a UFO, which could indicate a sighting had occurred in the 15th century and quite possibly by the artist. Also, there weren't planes in this time, and this is certainly not a bird in the sky as there is no clear indication of wings. So does that mean that it was meant to depict something that wasn't of its time, like a UFO? I think yes. Let us know in the comment section below. In our number one spot, we have Head of a Peasant Woman by Van Gogh. I had to put this painting in our number one spot as this was only just discovered and the world is so very excited to have discovered yet another Van Gogh masterpiece. If you don't know Van Gogh, well, he is one of the most popular artists of the 20th century, so just take a moment and do some Googling. Anyways, a hidden prize was recently discovered behind his piece, The Head of a Peasant Woman, by the conservators at the National Gallery of Scotland. After x-raying the piece and not expecting much, they discovered that beyond the cardboard was not the peasant woman, but actually a self-portrait of Van Gogh. He was known to have done self-portraits, but to discover this, it must have been magical. The portrait is behind many layers of glue and cardboard and suspected to have been done this way to help protect the artwork for an upcoming exhibition in the early 20th century. How fascinating. I can't even imagine what that must have felt like to discover that. I bet you people around the world are now going to start x-raying all of the Van Goghs in the hopes of finding a hidden treasure. In our number 10 spot, we have the separation of light from darkness. This is a painting done by Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel, and yes, of course, he had some hidden anatomical illustrations throughout the painting. Apparently, if you look closely at the painting, you can find a depiction of the human spinal cord and the brain stem in the center of God's chest leading up to the throat. I mean, it could also be the clothing that he was wearing, but perhaps it's not. Perhaps he was trying to say that it's possible that God was a human, or perhaps he wasn't. <laughs> but I suppose that's what's cool about art. After the artist has finished, it is up to you to decide what it means to you. In our number nine spot, we have Cafe Terrace at Night. This is a beautiful painting that was done by the very great Vincent Van Gogh in 1888. The painting depicts a cafe at night in a beautiful French city. But upon further glance, a Van Gogh expert proposed a different theory. If you look at the man standing up in white, he looks like he could have long hair like Jesus, and he's standing around 12 men that could be his disciples, and one of them is slipping into the shadows, 
which could be seen as Judith. Oh, apparently there also seems to be a bunch of crucifixes throughout the painting, including one right above Jesus's head, and that leads us to believe this theory even more. Fascinating. In our number eight spot, we have the Ambassadors. The Ambassadors is a painting that was done in 1533 by Hans Halbiet. <laughs> by Hans Halbianeth Younger. At first glance, this is a nice painting. You know, it's two rich looking men that kind of look miserable. <laughs> That's what I originally saw at least. Anyone else with me? They look like they would rather be doing anything else but posing for a photograph. Anyways, if you look down at the base of this painting, you will see what appears to be a sideways skull. People believe that it is a reminder that death is around the corner, but personally, looking at the faces of these men, and perhaps they have experienced death most recently, and that is why they appear to be so unhappy. Hmm. Would love to know your thoughts in the comment section below. In our number seven spot, we have the music lesson. This painting was created by Johann Vermeer in 1662 to 1665. This painting has become known over time for perhaps its secret symbols of sexuality. In this painting, the woman looks like she is gazing down at the keys of a virginal, an instrument that is associated with female purity. However, apparently she is actually looking away from it, perhaps to meet the gaze of her instructor. Ooh, scandalous. This is shown by looking closely at her gaze in the mirror above her. Was this depicting a secret affair perhaps? There is also wine on the table that is considered an aphrodisiac and the instrument on the floor looks like it could also resemble a male's reproductive part if you know what I mean. So perhaps there are one or two secrets hidden within this painting. In our number six spot, we have View of Shaveningen Sands. This painting was made in 1641 by Hendrik van Anthonissen, and for quite some time it had a mystery to its viewers. People would look at the painting and think, what the heck are all the people on the beach standing around and looking at? It took 140 years for someone to remove a coat of yellow varnish while restoring the landscape, and this revealed that underneath there was a large whale on the beach, and that is what everyone was looking at. Wow. This is only a recent discovery in the last 10 years, and finally, this great secret has been solved. I wonder why the painter may have covered up the whale in the first place, though. Perhaps it was so that he could have a hidden secret within his painting. That's what I would do. In our number five spot, we have the Garden of Earthly Delights. The Garden of Earthly Delights was created between 1490 and 1510 by Hieronymus Bosch. This painting is truly epic to look at. It kind of blows my mind and makes me feel like the secrets of the world are hidden within it. In some areas, there looks like there are insect people, one specifically on a golden throne-like chair. Then there's a witch. And then there's just normal humans. A secret within this painting was only recently found by a college student, funny enough, and it's that if you zoom into the left hand corner of the piece, you can see a musical score tattooed across someone's behind, and that student even translated this and put it online for people to listen to. I personally actually listened to it, and it was awesome. Would recommend Googling it. In our number four spot, we have The Persistence of Memory. This is a painting done by Salvador Dali in 1931 and it is truly a sight to see. In this painting, you see a bunch of melting clocks that most people believe is an ode to Einstein's theory of relativity, as Salvador was known to be a very wise surrealist painter. But apparently he was once quoted as saying that the clocks were inspired by gooey cheese. Quote, the melting clocks are nothing other than the tender, extravagant, and solitary, paranoid, critical camembert of time and space. I suppose you can get inspiration from everywhere. In our number three spot, we have Madame X. Madame X is a painting that was done in 1884 by John Singer Sargent, and it is a painting of a Parisian socialite by the name of Virginie Amélie Avengino Goutro. Wow, okay. I'm proud. Apparently this painting had an original secret where one of the straps was falling off of her dress and it was believed that the painting scandalized the upper class society. John repainted the straps and renamed the painting and even moved to avoid embarrassment. Wow. Was this his 19th century way of revealing that she's rather promiscuous? If so, I'm here for it. Who knows, maybe he was having a secret affair with her and that was his way of telling others. In our number two spot, we 
have the prophet Zechariah. This is yet another work by Michelangelo where there is believed to be some cheeky hidden secrets throughout. The painting was done in the Sistine Chapel in 1508 to 1512. The other works that we talked about in this list and in part one of this video showed that perhaps Michelangelo put some wise ideas in his works. But this painting shows that perhaps he was feeling a bit cheeky when he was doing this painting as it is possible that the young boy on the prophet's back is doing a sort of flipping off gesture <laughs> of that time. It looks like he has put his thumb between his middle and index finger and yeah, that's the 16th century equivalent to giving the middle finger. <laughs> If this were to be true and the boy is gesturing in this way to the prophet in the painting, this could very well reveal Michelangelo's true feelings about the Pope, they say. Ooh, 16th century gossip. This is starting to feel a little bit like Bridgerton, but you know, 16th century. In our number one spot we have, of course, the Mona Lisa. Da Vinci's Mona Lisa is certainly one of the most famous oil paintings in the world. Famous due to its mysteriousness and people have wondered for centuries what the heck was going on within her as her facial expression is the most curious. Without a doubt, she was a woman carrying a secret. The painting also holds the Guinness World Record for the highest known painting insurance in history, around just, you know, the small fortune of $870 million. Pennies, basically, pretty well. <laughs> this painting was made around 1503 to 1506 and has some speculation around it, including some believe that Mona Lisa was pregnant and that her holding her tummy depicts the secret, as well as the veil she was wearing was off often worn by pregnant women. It was also discovered that there are numbers and letters in her eyes. L was in her right eye, believed to be the initial of the painter himself, Leonardo, and S in the left eye, believed to possibly be the first letter of the woman in the painting, which would totally debunk who people always believed her to be, Lisa Garadini. The number 72 is also seen in the left eye, which could be a biblical reference as the number seven could mean the creation of the world, they say, it took God, you know, seven days to create the world. And number two represents duality, male and female. The number's significance just makes me believe even more so that she was pregnant. Maybe the S represents the initial of her future child. Who knows? Number 10, Memorial. Memorial is the name of this painting by Benton Spruance made in 1951. Now just looking at it makes me feel like it's haunted. I don't need any backstory here. The painting is of head, skulls, and creepy masks on what appears to be a stake in the ground, and there's a cross in the background. It's just unsettling, and one of those faces has black eyes and only two teeth, and I do not like it. Benton was known for making creepy work, so it's not shocking that he came up with this. A number of guests and staff believe that this painting is haunted, and I believe them. Looking at the painting gives people an uneasy feeling, and apparently there was a cold spot on the painting, which was strange because it was never near a vent or window that could cause a breeze. The painting was a gift from John B. Turner, and I suspect that he knew it was haunted and wanted to get rid of it. Number 9. Scarab Rumor has it that the Smithsonian is home to many ancient Egypt treasures and artifacts. Now, were they stolen? That's a completely different story, but it's said that these items are cursed. With all those movies about Egyptian curses, this really doesn't surprise me. They have a scarab believed to be from King Tut. If you don't know what a scarab was like me, they were popular amulets and impression seals in ancient Egypt. There are many of them, and through their inscriptions and typology, they are an important source of information for archaeologists and historians of the ancient world. Now, it's said that bad luck will follow anyone who touches King Tut's body or anything in his tomb, and since this belonged to him, I'd say watch out. In 1922, when King Tut's tomb itself was unearthed after more than 3,000 years of uninterrupted rest, some believe the pharaoh unleashed a powerful curse of death and destruction upon all who dared to disturb his eternal slumber. So since this scarab belonged to him, it's believed to actually be cursed from King Tut himself, so I'd stay away. Number 8. Mummified Cat Head 
Yep, you heard that right, a mummified cat head. Only the head though, we don't know where the rest of the body is. It's a cat from 332 to 30 BC, it's wrapped in linen and the ears are elaborately painted and modeled on the face of this cat mummy to give it the look of a real cat. The head contains a cat skull and it was originally part of a complete cat mummy. Many workers have claimed to have seen a cat apparition move around this display. It's also seen around the halls and other exhibits as well. Now it's probably just trying to find the rest of its body and doesn't mean any harm, but I feel like having a ghost cat though would be fun. Number 7. The Weeping Woman the Weeping Woman, aka La Llorona, is a legend that has a wide variety of details and versions. In a typical version of the legend, a beautiful woman named Maria marries a rich man to whom she bears two children with. One day, Maria sees her husband with another woman, and in a fit of blind wage, she drowns their offspring in a river, which she immediately regrets. Unable to save them and consumed by guilt, she drowns herself as well, but is unable to enter the afterlife, forced to be in purgatory and and roam this earth until she finds her offspring. The legend of La Llorona is deeply rooted in Mexican popular culture. It's said that if you hear her cries being distant, it means she's close, and if they seem close, that she's far. She usually has a loud cry, kind of like a coyote or owl. Now, the Smithsonian has this terrifying weeping woman doll, which currently isn't on display anymore, and you know, I wonder why. Apparently, it was freaking out too many guests out, and just by looking at it, I can see why. It's also been reported that staff have heard sounds of weeping coming from the doll at night. Some people believe that the weeping lady is trapped in that doll, and all I gotta say is that doll is in the wrong museum, it needs to go join Annabelle and other cursed objects in Ed and Lorraine Warren's museum. Number 6. The Creeping Doll the creeping doll, which is a creepy doll, is a prototype for a doll that could crawl on its own. It was invented in 1871 by George P. Clark. The goal of the doll was to make it crawl exactly like human babies do. The doll's arm, legs, and heads were all made of plaster and were painted. They were then attached to a brass clockwork body and moved along with the gears. To be honest, it looks like that creepy robotic baby like the one in Toy Story Sid has. Does anyone else see the resemblance? Now, with this just being creepy already, it gets even creepier. Staff have seen this doll creep forward on its own, and others have heard the sounds of children laughing and crying near it. Although I think what's truly haunting about this is how many times I've said the word creepy. Number 5. Mary Todd Lincoln's Dress Mary Todd Lincoln served as the First Lady of the United States from 1861 until the death of her husband, President Abraham Lincoln, in 1865. Mary Todd married Abraham Lincoln on November 4, 1842 at her sister Elizabeth's home in Springfield, Illinois. She absolutely loved her husband and was completely distraught when he passed away. She was in mourning for a long time and stayed in widow's clothes up until her own death. Due to this, she never wore any of her other dresses. She had a beautiful purple dress lined with lace, and she gave this dress, plus others, to her family members. The purple dress was given to her cousin, Elizabeth Todd Grimsley. In 1916, Elizabeth's son sold the dress to the Smithsonian, where it is today. It was to be a part of the First Lady's collection. Now, it's said though that this isn't any ordinary dress. Oh no, it is said that the dress is haunted by Mary Todd herself. People have heard weeping when they have been near this dress, which is just sad. There have also been times where people have claimed to see Mary Todd's apparition standing beside the dress. She means no harm, I guess she's just there to mourn, but that would be a sad and creepy sight. Number 4. The Hope Diamond the Hope Diamond is gorgeous. It's 45.52 carats, it's a dark grayish blue, and the pendant surrounding the Hope Diamond contains 16 white diamonds. The necklace chain it's on also contains 45 white diamonds. Now, French monarchs and heiress and at least one unlucky postman have met misfortune after possessing it. The Hope Diamond's allegedly cursed reputation is well known. The diamond gets its name from the London banker Henry T. Hope, who purchased it in 18. 
1839. After Hope's death, the diamond passed through the hands of various owners. In America, the gem was feared to be lost in a shipwreck, but the rumor was refuted when the diamond appeared at a public auction in Paris on June 29, 1909. Evelyn Walsh McLean, a Washington DC socialite and wife of the former owner of the Washington Post, acquired the diamond in 1911 for $180,000. Now she too suffered the curse of the diamond as her husband died in a mental institution, her eldest son died in a car accident, and her daughter took too many sleeping pills. She believed in the curse, but she continued to wear the diamond and would not sell it for fear of bringing bad luck to someone else, which is really considerate if you think Think about it. After Evelyn's death in 1947, the diamond was found along with 4 million worth of other jewels stored in shoeboxes in her bedroom. Then Henry Harry Winston, a leading American jeweler and gem dealer, bought the diamond from her estate in 1949 and in 1958 he donated the diamond to the Smithsonian Institution where it is today. Number 3. Black Aggie Black Aggie is the name given to a statue formerly placed on the grave of General Felix Angus in Jurid Ridge Cemetery in Pikesville, Maryland. Beginning with its installation in 1926, it was surrounded by many urban legends. These included that the spirits of individuals buried at Jurid Ridge will annually convene at the statue, that no grass would grow on the ground where the statue's shadow would lie during the daytime, and that the statue would animate itself during the night, whether by physically moving or by showing glowing red eyes. Those who see her eyes are said to have their lives ended by her, or she will cause you to go blind. Oh, and one last thing, if you sit on the statue's lap at midnight, you will die in two weeks. So, you know, that's cool. Due to these urban legends, it led to much unwelcomed attention towards the statue. Many people were caught breaking into the cemetery at night to visit it, and the pedestal was frequently vandalized. So in response, the Angus family, disturbed by the attention the statue received, donated it to the Smithsonian in 1967. I know what you're thinking, it's just a statue Emily, it can't hurt me. Well, apparently there are real stories about this statue taking people's lives. One man put a cigarette out on the statue, which is just disrespectful to begin with, and he was later found dead due to him getting pew pewed in the head, if you know what I mean. Another man was found dead at the foot of the statue and no one knows his cause of death. So if I were you, I'd stay far, far away from Black Aggie. Number 2. Abraham Lincoln's Hat Yes, the Smithsonian has acquired one of Honest Abe's hats, but just not any hat, the one he died in. So of course, if you have an item of clothing that someone died in, I'm sure it's going to be haunted. The last time he put on this hat was to go to Ford's Theater in April 1865. After he died, his hat and everything from Ford's Theater was preserved. In 1867, it made its way to the Smithsonian, and it was originally put in the basement and not on display because they thought there was too much excitement at the time and kept it quiet. The Smithsonian didn't even reveal that they had the hat until 1893. It's now one of the Smithsonian's most treasured objects and obviously it's haunted by Abe himself. A number of people have seen his apparition around the museum, and does that mean that him and Mary haunt the Smithsonian together? Cause that's a couple goals. And coming in at number one is the founder. Now this isn't any type of art or artifact, but it's said that James Smithson, the founding donor of the Smithsonian Institute, has been spotted wandering the organization's castles, home to its administrative and information headquarters, on numerous occasions. This starts to make a lot of sense when you learn that James's remains have been kept at the museum since 1904. James' frequent appearances were supposedly causing such a ruckus that in 1973, his remains were briefly dug up for investigation. His skeleton was in fact still safely in the coffin though, but there's nothing to say of his spirit. Other motives for him being dug up might have been to search for documents rumored to have been buried with him, but I want to think it's because they actually wanted to make sure that he was dead. He's not the only ghostly worker found wandering around though, as it's said that other former employees' apparitions have been spotted too, which is scary. Mm -hmm. 